Well, good morning, my friends. If you would open your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We are going to be talking about the last part of this chapter. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at the beginning part of 1 Corinthians 14, and then Last week, because it was Easter, we jumped ahead to chapter 15 to talk about the resurrection, Uh, but now we're going to back up and take up again where we left off in chapter 14. The title of this sermon is, excuse me, Order in the Church, Order in the Church. I am a church man. That means... My Christian faith leads me to be part of a local church. Not just numbered among the church universal, but actually to have a place and a time where I gather together with other people. Paul was a church man. Jesus was the ultimate church man. As a matter of fact, he said, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So I'm a church man. Are you a church man? Are you a church woman? I hope you are. Probably you are because you're here. And if you're joining us online, it's because if you could be, you would be here. Glad to have you tuning in. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the church And covering the first part of the chapter, the theme of that part of the chapter was building up the church for the glory of God. You know, you could summarize our reason for existence as human beings in the following way, that God be glorified, that the church be edified or built up, and that the world evangelized. As a matter of fact, The evangelization of the world, the edification of the church are all ultimately to the glory of God. So we may have a number of things that motivate us as we live our lives. But if these things aren't at the top of our list, that we're looking to them in some way, then our lives are going to be out of joint and things are going to go worse for us. This is what we should be aiming for in all of our lives, that God be glorified, that the church be edified, and that the world be evangelized. Now, in chapter 14, Paul is addressing that middle phrase, the edification of the church, the building up of the church. The title of the sermon a couple weeks ago was, let's build up the church. It's a great idea. Let's build up the church. We want the church to be built up. And that phrase, built up or building up, occurs over and over again. Now, you'll also recall that the focus of that had to do with spiritual gifts, especially the spiritual gifts of tongues and prophecy. Because in this mini section that we're looking at, chapters 12 through 14 of 1 Corinthians called Showing the Spirit, It's really a discussion about these things called the gifts of the Spirit. And the gifts of the Spirit are for the building up of the church. They're for the common good. So in chapter 14 and verse 12, we could take this as indicative of that whole section. Paul writes to them, he says, Since you're eager for manifestations of the Spirit, gifts of the Spirit, let's strive to excel in building up the church. Of course, the problem was those gifts of the Spirit were being misused, and the reason Paul wrote this chapter was to correct, to instruct, but all for the purpose of building up. And his main point was the church is built up when we use intelligible speech. Is this all coming back to you? This is what I was talking about a couple of weeks ago. I mean, I had to go back and review it myself. What did I say a couple of weeks ago? I better go back. Those of you that are old enough to remember Perry Mason, television lawyer, he used to have this phrase. He said to the witness, let me refresh your memory. 
And so that's what I'm doing right now. I'm trying to refresh your memory. And to refresh our memories, Paul's point was this. The church is built up when we use intelligible speech. Words that can be understood. So, for example, the gift of tongues, as wonderful as it is, must be followed by an interpretation if it is going to build others up. Otherwise, the gift of tongues all by itself in a public meeting will just cause confusion. Paul says, you may be giving thanks well enough, but your neighbor is not being edified. He's not being built up. And if any visitors come, they'll be receiving a message, but the message they'll receive is, I guess I'm not welcome here. I can't understand the thing that's going on. And then beyond that, they'll probably say, I think those people are out of their minds. Well, that was about the gift of tongues. And pa pa Paul said that prophecy is, is better than uninterpreted tongues. Why? Because it edifies, it exhorts, it consoles. In other words, prophecy uses words that build up, that stir up, that cheer up. Words that benefit others, words that build up intelligible words, words that can be understood. Okay, so far, so good. But that doesn't completely solve the problems that they were facing in Corinth. No, it went a little further than that. Uh, there may be intelligible speech, but if it is unrestrained speech, if it is disorderly speech, if it is out of control, it's going to cause confusion. In some cases, it may even be shameful speech. So Paul has more to say, and we read now 1 Corinthians chapter 14, beginning at verse 26. What then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. See, there it is again. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three and each in turn and let someone interpret. But if there's no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent, notice that word, in church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent for you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all be encouraged and the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets for God is not a God of confusion but of peace as in all the churches of the saints the women should keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or was it from you that the word of God came, or are you the only ones it is reached? If anyone thinks he's a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So, my brothers, earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. So it's not enough that words be intelligible that our words be understood. Paul's also saying if our words are unrestrained, there will be confusion and disorder. And God is not a God of confusion. We do not want to misrepresent Him in any way. There are three paragraphs in our text here today. The first one begins with an encouraging observation and then gives some instruction about prophecy and tongues, placing some restrictions, some limitations on their youth. 
The second paragraph is what we call a hot potato. We'll pause on that for a moment. The third paragraph is a strong rebuke. All right, as I said, this portion of Scripture deals with unrestrained speech, but Paul actually begins with a general encouragement. He says, what then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. Now, these elements are all good, and they can all build up the church, but we shouldn't take this as some kind of a comprehensive pattern that we must follow. We don't follow this pattern. For example, there's no mention of the Lord's Supper here. There's no mention of public prayer or the public reading of Scripture, and these are all elements of worship when God's people come together that Paul mentions in other places. So this isn't prescriptive. It's just probably descriptive of what's going on in Corinth. Today, for instance, in various parts of this building from early on, there have been a number of classes already taught. There have been songs sung. There have been insights shared, prayers prayed, and it's all been for the building up of the church. It's going on even right now as we speak in other parts of the building with adults, with teens, with children. But, you know, even beyond these elements and even beyond what's taking place at this particular time, you should ask yourself the question on a Sunday morning, what can I bring to church today that might build up the church? What can I bring? Can I bring a, a smile, a cheerful greeting? Can I bring a warm heart? Can I interact with my friends and can I meet maybe some people that I've never met before and interact with them in a way that will express the love of God, the encouragement of the Holy Spirit? In other words, can I be a vessel that God uses in some way to bless others? A thoughtful, encouraging comment? A prayer that might encourage my brother or my sister? In general, uh, Don Carson had this to say about this particular portion of Scripture. He says, Paul's chief aim in these verses is not to lay out an exhaustive list of necessary ingredients in corporate worship, but it is to insist that the unleashed power of the Holy Spirit, characteristic of this new age, must be exercised in a framework of order, intelligibility, appropriateness, seemliness, dignity, and peace. So Paul is taking up his major concern here, and that is unrestrained speech that results in confusion and disorder. But before I proceed any further, I would like to point out that I am somewhat of an expert when it comes to unrestrained speech. I'm, uh, by profession, I'm, I'm a talker. I'm a professional talker. And, and I always have been, even before I became a Christian. Uh, this goes all the way back to the fourth grade. In my role as class clown, it was my job to carefully observe what was going on in class and then make appropriate funny comments about it. Now, Mrs. Adams, my fourth grade teacher, whom I, I know she liked me very much, well, she did not understand my gifts and callings. <laughs> and she repeatedly punished me for expressing them. My usual offense was unrestrained speech, and I would say that Mrs. Adams was relentless in her efforts to restrain my unrestrained speech. And so the punishment for offenses in her class was to make the offender stand in the corner for a specified period of time, stand in the corner. And uh, if you had to stand in the corner, that meant you, met, you missed morning recess, you missed afternoon recess, and you had to stay after school. So it was, it was quite the punishment. And um, one day, I remember I set a record. I got four separate offenses. I stood in every corner of the room in one day. But my record was broken by Jay. I could tell you his last name, but I won't because if he hears this sermon, I don't want to embarrass him. But Jay was put in 
every corner of the room and out in the hall in one day. A record. I wonder if Mrs. Adams realized the tremendous damage she did to my fragile psyche. <laughs> Actually, what, what the result of it was is that she learned me a little self-control. So, if you ask me, back in those days, why can't you control yourself? Why can't you be silent? I would have said, it is impossible. I have a gift that must be expressed. When I think of something funny, I just have to say it. And you know, humor can kind of skate close to the edge sometimes, and sometimes you actually can fall off the edge. Well, anyway, the Corinthians had a similar problem here. Unrestrained speech. I'm sure they had people who say, how can I be quiet when I've got this gift? I've got to express it. But the question, why must you express your gift whenever you feel like it? And what's the motivation for it? I mean, that's why Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 13. Motivation has to be love, not to get a laugh. Okay? So Paul is going at something actually very important here. He wants to give some guidance to counter this thing called unrestrained speech. So number one, first of all, restraining prophetic speech. He has something to say about tongues, and it's basically this. Two, or at most three, must be followed by an interpretation. If there's no one to interpret, then keep silent. You can talk to yourself, or you can talk to God. Call that silent prayer. That's tongues. Prophecy, again, two or three, then if something's revealed to another, let the first be silent. No striving, please. No speaking over others. No dominating the meeting. No attempt to impose on others by holding the floor and holding forth. Deference, humility, because people talking out of turn, talking all at once, Prophecies proceeding in a disorderly manner brings disrespect upon God. He's a God of order. He's a God of peace. He wants things done decently and order. He doesn't want confusion when things all mush together and you can't tell what's going on. So what does Paul do? He restricts the expression of tongues and prophecy. He limits how they are to be used. <gasps> Oh, Paul, my goodness, aren't you quenching the Spirit? Aren't you grieving the Spirit? No, I'm not quenching the Holy Spirit. I may be quenching some other spirits, but not the Holy Spirit. The clear implication in all of this is that those who exercise spiritual gifts actually do have control over themselves and their exercise. The spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. Otherwise, Paul's words are absurd, they're nonsense. But if this is true, if those in possession of spiritual gifts have control over them, then there's no ecstatic utterances here. Some people misunderstand gifts of the Spirit to be just out-of-body experiences when people just all of a sudden go off blathering in tongues in the middle of the metro or something like that. No, 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 no. No, we have control over these things. There's no out-of-control exercise of spiritual gifts. God is not a God of confusion. He's a God of peace. True spiritual gifts will always be expressed in tandem with true spiritual fruit. And the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. But there's a, something else here that bears mention. Did you see where in verse 29 he said, let Others weigh what is said. Let two prophets speak, or perhaps three, and let the others weigh what is said. Paul said something similar to the Thessalonians. He said, Do not despise prophecies, but test everything and hold fast that which is good. He said, In chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, we know in part and we prophesy in part. So prophecy must be evaluated, it must be tested, 
It must be weighed. By whom? By the others. That's the whole congregation. Paul writes this letter, by the way, to the whole congregation of Christians in Corinth. Not just the leaders, not just the elders. They're included, of course, and they bear responsibility for what takes place in the meetings. They bear responsibility in a way that others don't. They have a certain authority in that regard. They're included, but we're all to weigh prophetic utterances. We're all to test and to hold fast that part which is good. Now, the measuring rod for this in general, of course, is Scripture. But the implication in the verses cited is that prophecy is going to come with some degree of mixture, both human and divine. You see, the nature of prophecy in the New Testament is quite different from the prophecies of the Old Testament that we have recorded in Scripture. And the utterances of the prophets, like Isaiah and the others, are God's inspired authoritative word. In the New Testament, prophecy has a different cast. It's for edification, exhortation, for comfort. It's not really predictive. It's more a speaking forth of truth for the edification and building up of God's people. But when it comes out from a human vessel, it's going to have good and some that's perhaps a little bit off. And there's a standard by which we evaluate. It's really, does this consistent with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Does it edify and build up others? Is it encouraging? These are some of the ways that we can evaluate prophecy. Years ago, when we planted a church in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, finding a place to meet was very difficult. The church had previously met in various schools, in a fire hall, a restaurant, even met in a dog pound. There were a couple of Sundays where we couldn't find a place to meet on Sunday morning, so we met on Sunday afternoons. And it was at one of these afternoon meetings that a lady prophesied, and it went something like this. I believe the Lord is saying that this morning I call you to trust in me as your good shepherd, etc., etc., etc. And then after the meeting, a, a man came up to me very troubled. And he said, how could that have been God speaking to us? Doesn't he know the difference between morning and afternoon? Of course he does, I said. But the lady prophesying apparently doesn't. <laughs> you see, we know in part, and we prophesy in part. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Sometimes earthen vessels can't tell the difference between morning and afternoon. It doesn't discount the prophecy. What was said was good. It just had her timing a little off. That's what I mean when we have to evaluate certain things. Well, that's a little bit about restraining prophecy. There are some restrictions. There are some limitations so that things can be done decently in an order. But the second paragraph... Let me read it again. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak but should be in submission as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Paul here is restraining shameful speech. This is a hot potato, isn't it? Yeah. There's a few things to keep in mind before we try to understand this. First of all, this cannot be a blanket prohibition on women speaking because just a ch couple of chapters earlier uh, in chapter 11, Paul speaks of women praying and prophesying, presumably in the church gathered, and when they pray and prophesy, they're not doing it silently, they're speaking. And Peter, in Acts chapter 2, quoted the prophecy of Joel that said, your sons and your daughters would prophesy. Also, in this passage, women are not the only ones called to silence. We've seen that word occur already. There are appropriate times for silence. Silence. 
And one other thing to keep in mind is that the women addressed here in all likelihood are wives. Uh, the same Greek word for women and for wives is used. It's just one word for it. It depends on the context. And later in the verses here, when it talks about husbands, that's an indicator that the women being spoken to are not all women, but wives, and only in a particular sense. So what does Paul have in mind here? Well, he hasn't taken up a new theme. Uh, the entire chapter from beginning to end, including this paragraph, has to do with prophecy and with evaluation of prophecy. That's actually the immediate context, the weighing or the evaluation of prophetic words. So when Paul says women should keep silent in the church, it isn't a total silence because their prayers and their prophecies are anticipated. In all likeliness, the silence here has to do with silence in regard to weighing or evaluating prophecy. Did the prophetic word that was given require some explanation or some further direction? Because if so, that would be a teaching and a leadership issue. And teaching and leadership in the church are a role assigned to men, especially the elders. Apparently, some of the women were not just weighing the prophecy, but they were weighing in with their opinions and did so in a manner that could take up the role of teacher or leader and likely in a way that was disrespectful of their husbands. So, first of all, what's in view here is not women in general, but, and it's not a total blanket prohibition, but it's women who are wives and they're speaking out in a way that was shameful. Uh, just again, a little brief aside here, uh, the New Testament in the Bible distinguishes the roles of women and men, the roles of husbands and wives. They are not the same. The differences in role are not a matter of inferiority or superiority because we are all equal in the sight of God. We are created in the image and likeness of God, male and female, he created them. One is not greater or more important or superior than the other, but there is a difference between male and female. As much as our culture would like to confuse that, it's still true that there are differences between men and women. There are differences between husbands and wives, and those differences are from God and they are good. Both men and women are equal in God's sight, but the passage reflects the differing roles God has assigned to men and women since creation. So when Paul refers to the law here, he's not referring to a specific law, but probably the order of things as they were created in Genesis 2, Genesis being the first book of the law. So what about that statement, it is shameful? Well, likely there's something cultural going on here. And it may not entirely be the same for us today. That word shameful is a tip-off. Shameful is different from disorderly. It has to do with what a society views as inappropriate behavior and it's relative to any given culture. What is appropriate for men and women to do in one culture may be inappropriate in another. Some of you here come from different countries where there are different values and different things are regarded as appropriate or inappropriate. And if we go back to the ancient world, we have, and, and that's what we have to do when we interpret Scripture, we have to go back to what and try to understand what the cultural norms may have been at that time. And frankly, we just don't have a lot of data as to what was going on here with regard to the roles of wives and husbands and what was considered appropriate and not. You know, we often make the mistake of thinking that our own culture today is the most enlightened and is the way that everyone should be. And that's because, by and large, we're comfortable with our own cultural norms. 
And so we judge ancient times by our own supposedly enlightened times. And we ask questions like, but how could they possibly think that way? Well, it was another time. It was another place. By the way, in philosophy, this is called the historical fallacy. It's taking our values of today and superimposing them on a previous time and making judgments that may be warranted, but they may not. How can we know what are timeless truths? Well, that's what this book is for, rightly interpreted. And when I say rightly interpreted, there are hermeneutical standards for interpreting the Word of God. And sometimes superficial and uneducated people who do not understand the Bible will look at some of the things they find in the Bible and write the whole thing off because they don't take the time to really understand what the Word of God is teaching. And we don't want that to happen to us. Well, here, women were saying things that were shameful to their husbands. Now, I ask you, is it wrong for a man to shame his wife publicly? Yes. Is it wrong for a wife to shame her husband publicly? Yes. But exactly what constitutes shaming will be cultural specific. To illustrate this, you know, my wife and I often find ourselves in settings where we're interacting with other people that we do not know. Sometimes they are from other cultures. Sometimes they may be, well, they're not older than us anymore, but they're younger than us. And, and we find ourselves in these different settings. And my wife and I joke with each other a lot. And if we're in a conversation, we might tell a story or bring up an anecdote or something like this. And often my wife has said to me, and she's wondering what I'm going to say right now, Often she will say to me after we leave, did I say anything wrong? Did I say anything that was disrespectful when I told that story about you? And invariably my answer is no, no, not at all. But you see the fact that that is a category for her, I appreciate that because my wife fears the Lord and she loves the Lord and she wants to respect the Lord and me. So that's a category. Well, something was going on here with these wives in the Corinthian church and the way they were expressing themselves. Paul says it was shameful. They ought to keep silent. And if you want to learn about that, talk to your husband about it at home. It doesn't mean that he's the answer man that answers all your questions. He's not the only channel of grace into your family, but he is a channel of grace, and showing respect for him is important. That's what submissiveness means, which is something we're all to be. Submission is not just something for a wife in a home. Submission is something that should characterize all of us. It is an attitude of support for others and that attitude ought to characterize the Christian it's a part of humility so when Paul is talking about these things let's not get our dander up too much let's try to go back and understand what's taking place something was going on and it was serious enough for Paul to call it out and he doesn't stop there the third paragraph contains a sharp rebuke one commentator said it is short, but it is not sweet. He says in verse 36, Or was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Paul's tone is not sarcastic, but it is ironic. He says, was it from you that the word of God came? Word of God is another phrase to describe the gospel, which Paul's going to talk about in chapter 15. Was it from you that the, was it from you that the gospel came? No, it didn't come from them. It, it came to them. Are they the only ones that have received it? No. All the churches have received it. 
Can it be that the gospel only came from you? No, it didn't originate from you. So therefore, you may not just do as you please. What I'm writing to you, he says, is a reference about all that he said about spiritual gifts and what he said is authoritative. Paul was conscious of his apostolic authority as he wrote. That is an authority that none of us have. Not your pastors, not your friends, not your husband. Only the apostles have apostolic authority. And only what we have that is inscripturated has authority. The Holy Spirit helps us understand it. But Paul, aware of his apostolic authority as he wrote to them, was very direct. He was very blunt. He was not afraid of using his authority because he knows it's for their benefit. He said to them in his second letter a couple of times, just one verse here, he says, for even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. Paul had this interesting relationship with the Corinthians. He was their spiritual father. They only knew the Lord because he brought the message of the gospel to them. So he was their father in the faith. And he did not like to exert authority, but when they pushed him to it, he did. He said, I do have authority, but it is for building up, not for tearing down. Sometimes that kind of authority requires the one in authority to say no. Sometimes the father in a family must say no. Sometimes the mother must say no. But it's for the good of the children. See, Paul was right. The Corinthians in many things were wrong. But he loves them. That's why he reproves them. So these are sober words. He says, if anyone thinks he's a prophet or spiritual, and many of them did think just that, he says, well, let them acknowledge that what I'm writing is the command of the Lord. And if you don't recognize it, you are not recognized. Now, what that really means is you are not recognized by God. And that's very serious. Some in the Corinthian church did not respect the apostles' words. They were actually disrespectful of the word of God. But again, Paul's not speaking from his own authority. It's the authority of God. He's writing as an apostle, and he's calling on them to submit to God for their good and his glory. Again, submission is not just for women. It is enjoined upon us all. We all stand under the authority of God's word and God's spirit. It judges us. We do not judge it. Well, that's not all Paul has to say here. He dearly loves them, so his tone changes at the close. In the last two verses, so my brothers and sisters earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. But all things should be done decently and in order. Paul began this chapter by talking about prophecy in tongues. He ends the chapter by talking about prophecy in tongues. So all that is in between is inclusive of his instruction in this area. He's not quenching the Spirit. He's not grieving the Spirit. What grieves the Spirit, what quenches the Spirit, is disorder. Paul's bringing order to where there had been confusion. God is not a God of confusion. The Corinthian church was young and immature. This is a middle-aged church. Been around how many years now? 45, 50, something like that? We're middle-aged. Been around for a while. This is not corrective for us, but it is instructive. We should earnestly desire spiritual gifts. We should desire to speak intelligible words that build up. We should desire to speak inappropriate, not unrestrained and disorderly ways. 
Because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. That's why Paul was a church man. That's why I'm a church man. That's why I hope you are church people. This, the church, is precious to Jesus. It's precious to Paul. It should be precious to us. So let's build up the church. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the church of Jesus Christ because it is through your church that we come to understand the gospel message. It has come to us through the apostles who witnessed to Jesus and who carried on by proclaiming, by teaching, by evangelizing, and by building churches. And the Word of God that has come down to us in the Bible, we understand that, Father, to be for our instruction, for our good, so that we might not rep misrepresent you, but reflect your love, your glory, your peace, your order, your decency, your integrity. We thank you in Jesus' name. Please help us to walk in your ways. Amen.